Hey guys, welcome back uh, to the last of our um, attack detection fundamentals workshops. Um, so far, we've had Ricardo taking us through initial access. Um, we've had Anarts taking us through code exec and persistence techniques using the Astroth malware. Um, uh, we explored some discovery and lateral movement uh, techniques together last week. And today we have uh, guys in the US, Derek and Jordan, uh, who are going to be covering us off with some um, detection opportunities for commander control or C2 um, and exfiltration. So let's get started. So as I said, we've got uh, Derek and Jordan. They're both uh, part of our, our incident response practice. Um, Derek is an associate security consultant uh, and Jordan is a lead uh, in the US and a senior security consultant. Um, you're probably pretty familiar with the, the format for this and the goals of this series. Um, it's a classic uh, offense informs defense. Um, we basically want to take some offensive tradecraft, understand how it works, understand the opportunities for detection um, and ultimately find ways that we can, as I say, detect and ultimately prevent them. Um, what we're looking at here is something that we deem to be, uh, as the name suggests, the fundamentals, the kind of building blocks that underpin um, some of the enterprise products that you're probably very familiar with. So obviously there's far more going on there when it comes to kind of data analysis and aggregation and correlation, um, as well as things like external threat feeds, et cetera. Um, but what we think here is, is a good a good basis um, for the way in which uh, these tools operate. So what we're gonna do, just as always, analyze, emulate, observe. Um, so we're going to take the techniques, we're going to try them out in our lab. Um, we're going to use a variety of open source tooling uh, and we're going to observe uh, the traces that they leave behind, the opportunities that we have to build some effective detections. Um, before we jump in, uh, just as always, just to kind of clarify the way in which we're doing these things, um, we've got a slightly more developed lab setup than the first couple of workshops, but um, still relatively simple. We've got our attacker host um, that's going to have some of our RC2 frameworks on them. Uh, we've got our target workstation um, and for the purposes of the final um, lab in, in, in this session, we're going to be making use of um, Roberto Rodriguez's help stack again. Um, so there's a few links at the bottom there from just from same as last week um, that you can use if you haven't already got um, a lab environment set up for yourselves. Um, but we're going to be making use of, of a number of open source um, offensive tools, so things like um, Covenant, things like Empire, and also things like C3. Um, we're going to be taking a closer look at um, the, the new Dropbox channel that was released today. Um, and we're also going to be using defensive tools. So I mentioned um, Helk. Um, we've also got Ruben Boone and Silk ETW. Um, and we're also using um, uh, Sysmon as well. Um, so some of those you should be reasonably familiar with by now. Um, just as always, um, this workshop is going to be recorded and made available after after this session. Um, and we're also going to have um, the lab scripts uh, for, the, for the three labs we have today. They're also uh, available now for you to look at as well. Um, I should mention that the uh, Q&A is unfortunately unavailable uh, for this session. Um, but if you want to leave comments um, on the YouTube video that goes up after this, then we'll happily try and answer those um, as, as we see them as well. So. Um, I'm going to hand over now to, to Derek and Jordan to take us through our final session. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Alfie. Uh, hi, everybody. Jordan here. So uh, let's jump right into things. Um, today, as Alfie said, we'll be covering the C2 part of the MITRE attack framework and also the exfiltration piece. So if you watched all the other labs, this is kind of the uh, the capstone of that if that makes sense. Um, if you haven't watched the other labs, go check them out. They're they're really awesome. Uh, and uh, hopefully they'll they'll be able to give some more context around this. But today we'll, we'll be talking about command and control and exfiltration um, and focusing on, you know, how to set that up from an attacker's perspective and also how to detect it from a defensive perspective. Uh, one thing that's important to note that I want to put out there right away too is that C2s from a detection perspective are one of the hardest things of all of these stages to detect. Um, they're meant to be evasive, they're meant to be sneaky, uh, and they're not something that, you know, it, you can just sort of toss a rule in and, and detect it. So uh, the detections that we show you today are going to be very specific to the labs we've got, and they will take some configurations to, uh, to get sorted and, and work on your environment. But feel free to, um, as Alfie said, ask us any questions on the, the YouTube videos if, if you want some more clarification around that or, or help with setting those up. So uh, let's go ahead and define what exactly is a C2. So a C2 is a, you know, it stands for command and control, 
and it's techniques and uh, software that adversaries can use to communicate with their attacking systems. So, uh, you know, think of it as a sort of a beacon that calls out to their external server or workstation or whatever it is that they're using to attack a, a victim network. Um, it, it's sort of the thing that sits on the, the infected computer and allows them to, to control it and command it, just like it says in the name. Um, and then as far as data exfiltration, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but uh, this is just any technique that these actors can use to uh, exfiltrate data as stealthily as possible. Um, it might also include uh, packaging the data, it might include encrypting the data, uh, but it's just any technique that they can use to, you know, get data out in as efficiently a way as possible. So uh, an example of this and, and one that you'll be seeing today is uh, data, data exfiltration using a legitimate cloud provider um, to exfiltrate data from a network. So using a trusted service to, uh, to take data out is like I was saying, something that's very difficult to detect and uh, and something that hopefully we can give you some some insight on how to detect today. So um, how exactly are we going to detect it? Well, we'll be showing you uh, two main log sources, namely uh, networking and, and EDR log sources for today. Uh, networking and, and EDR are, are definitely I would say the most reliable when it comes to detecting C2 traffic, uh, just because you know from the networking perspective, it's always going to be something that happens on the network because it needs to communicate out. Um, and then from an EDR perspective, that'll always just give you the most in-depth information. So uh, specifically the artifacts we're going to be looking at are ETWs on the EDR side, that's Windows ETWs, which are essentially the, uh, the under the hood events that are happening on Windows. And then from a networking perspective, we'll be looking at packet capture data. So what you have in your environment as far as networking goes may vary, but generally you'll you'll have very similar information from something like a firewall or, or a web proxy. It's also possible to detect stuff like this with these other artifacts. You know, if, if you have host memory or uh, endpoint logs like Windows event logs, it's, there are ways to detect these things, but what we're showing you today are, are really the ones that uh, we think are best to, to focus in on when it comes to detecting C2 traffic. So uh, just to kind of jump into what we will be taking a look at um, to, to show you guys these things and demonstrate, our, uh, we're going to have three labs. We'll start off with a pretty straightforward one. Uh, we're going to look at PowerShell Empire using HTTP. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty straightforward protocol. Uh, I'm sure you all have used it in the past. If you aren't, I'm not sure how you're you're listening to this, but uh, as far as Empire goes, uh, that's a pretty common framework and Derek will give us a bit more about that in a second. Uh, then we'll lead into a, a DNS based C2, which is a little bit trickier, a little bit more uncommon and, and a lot more stealthy than something like HTTP. Um, and then finally, we'll we'll drop into the Dropbox C2, which is a uh, a pretty new technique where malicious actors are using cloud services to exfiltrate data and uh, in command and control network devices uh, with you know trusted cloud provider services like Dropbox. So stick around for that one. It's it's pretty interesting and it, it's much more uh, cutting edge than than these first two that we've got to present to you, but. Nevertheless, uh, they're all interesting, and, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Derek to get us started with the, the first one, the Empire C2. Thanks, Jordan. So uh, as Jordan said, I'm Derek, and I'm going to start with the Empire C2. So to give you a little bit of a background, Empire is a very popular framework using PowerShell to um, create a C2 channel between attackers and defenders. Um, it's deprecated, but it's still in uh, used by large uh, groups of attackers. And so just keep in mind as we go through this that there's actually a lot of functionality with Empire. And um, using the labs themselves should give you a chance to um, it's to do the attacks that we've done at this presentation, but also to maybe um, try out some new attacks for yourself in order to be able to detect those because there's a lot of functionality in this. So for us, we're going to start off by using a malicious HTA stager. So what this will do is it will create an Empire agent 
And uh, what will happen is, is the stager will connect back using a small piece of code to retrieve the full implant from Empire. And that full implant will just be a PowerShell payload and the whole thing will be transmitted over HTTP. So we might remember this um, HTA stager as it, I think it was shown in lab number one. Um, and it, in that case, it was used with um, Coatic. And uh, what an HTA stager does is when it's double clicked, the behavior is similar to an execution of a normal executable. And um, it just will simply launch and then connect back and we'll have a connection from there. To uh, demonstrate this, we'll hop into a demo in just a moment and we'll show how this, exactly this works. So what we're doing here is um, showing all the listeners that Empire has set up. I've already set up one listener for HTTP. Now off screen, what we're doing is we're launching the payload, the HTA payload, which I haven't shown here, but that's what's happening on the victim machine. We'll receive a reverse connection in just a moment. So yeah, right now on the Windows 10 machine, I'm executing the HTA payload and should launch back to give us a connection back. This connection um, will be uh, a, a direct connection from machine to machine, so it's not using any cloud services in between. And once that connection has been received, what we'll be able to do is we'll actually be able to um, do some, execute a who am I command on the box after we choose to interact with it. And then from there, we'll be able to um, receive back a connection telling us uh, who the, the box responds to. Exactly, and then it will tell us the name of the box. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about what we saw there. So what we observed was HTTP traffic accessing the following URLs. So obviously you didn't see that in the screen we just saw, but I'm going to show you using a packet capture how we could have seen this traffic. So you notice here on the right, there are a number of get and post requests to the URLs that we just saw um, in, the last, in the last slide. And so what's happening is, is Empire is using these get and post requests to connect back and forth between the Empire agent on the attacking machine and then the victim agent on the Windows 10 host machine. So it's accessing these default URLs and this gives us an early opportunity for detection. And I'll show you what this looks like in the code now. So as we can see here, um, the default URIs include admin get PHP, news PHP, and login process PHP. So these are meant to be things that look legitimate at first, but as we'll see a little bit later on, they're not um, legitimate uh, for what we're doing with them. Additionally, there's a default uh, user agent for this, which could also be aided in, in detection. Just to show you a, a simple sort of who am I command and what that looks like, you can see here in red, that's the attacking machine. And what it's, it, what it's doing is it's sending the request to the victim machine for the who am I. And then what's happening is, is that the victim machine is then posting back the response to the admin get.php, which should immediately give ring a bell because um, admin slash get.php is one of those default URLs. Um, and additionally, uh, you probably shouldn't be posting anything to a slash admin slash get page. But we'll go into that a little bit more deeply in just a moment. So now we're going to talk about some of the encrypted traffic that we saw over HTTP. So to see this, we're going to follow the TCP stream um, using Wireshark. And as we can see, there's sort of a normal HTTP 404 response that's being posted to the admin slash get. However, you might notice there's some encrypted traffic above that in the request. So that's where the actual response is being transmitted. So it's not extremely easy to read this. However, if you do have some suspected streams, you could use this in order to see if there's some encrypted traffic going over HTTP in a non-standard manner as we see here. There's also um, another thing going on here, which is that there's some HTTP traffic from the victim to host on port 8081. So this type of traffic is probably going to simply be blocked by your firewall, depending on your configuration. However, an attacker might get a little bit sneakier and use something like port 80 or port 443 in order to make it look legitimate. However, you should still watch out for HTTP traffic going over 443 because it's reserved for HTTPS. And additionally, you'd want to be um, watching out for any kind of traffic going over DNS channels, even though it's not actually DNS. So this is a really important uh, thing to watch for. If you see any encrypted activity over HTTP on, an, uh, on a non-standard port, that could be a very quick win on your network. So now we're gonna show another demonstration of data exfiltration.
So what we're going to do now is we're just going to execute a download command on the machine. We're already interacting with it just like from the last demonstration. So this download will take probably about 20 seconds. And what it will be doing is it's downloading a credentials file and it's saving it onto the, um, the attacking machine. So it's really that easy to download files using this uh, C2 framework. And once it's done downloading, we will hop into the packet capture in just a moment just to show you exactly what that looks like on the back end. And as you can see during this download demonstration, um, the packets are being split up and uh, into different requests. So I'll show you what that looks like on the back end. We'll look at this Wireshark uh, capture. And so as we can see here, the file was split up into roughly equal pieces. So what this is indicating is that um, the file itself needs to be split in order to be uploaded. However, I'd like to um, show your attention to a few things here, which is that there's a continuous block of post requests in a row. And as you'll note, they're going to those URLs that we talked about earlier, those default um, PowerShell Empire URLs. And so it's doing those all in a row, which it should be um, an indicator that it's something is not right. If you're uploading a file, it should be going to different, or excuse me, should be going to the same URL, not to a series of different URLs, especially things like news.php. There's no reason to be uploading a file to that. Um, and as of one final note, you might see the 158 post request at the bottom, and that's actually just the response from Empire telling us that the file download is completed. So to summarize what we observed, we observed a continuous block of post requests from the attacker to the victim, and these were um, of nearly identical size, except for what is a limitation by the program itself. And uh, you should definitely watch out for any anomalous traffic where you see a continuous post request originating from uh, one source, and they're going to a number of different sources all in a row, and they're all the same size. It should be very suspicious. So one way to detect this in um, the simplest case would, simp would be to write a snort rule such as this, which all this does is it alerts on any traffic that has a 404 and also has um, the content marks up IS 7.5. However, um, what we would recommend is using some sort of thresholds for this. So using this in conjunction with other rules um, and perhaps in conjunction with looking at some um, dodgy URLs and using this, you really gonna have to tune this kind of rule for it to be useful. Um, if you just use this rule by itself, you might end up with um, a number of false positives, but that doesn't make it useless. It just means you need to tune it to make sure that you're actually able to um, weed out some of those false positives. It is a relatively unusual configuration, and if we were to run this snort rule on our data set, what we would get is we would notice the possible empire activity, and uh, we'd be able to alert on it and then investigate it from there. So after this, I'm going to hand off to Jordan to talk about lab number two and he'll tell us some more details about DNS cat. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, so uh, moving on from HTTP and Empire, uh, like I was saying earlier, we have a bit more of an advanced technique here, which is using DNS as a, a C2 and an exfiltration channel. So uh, DNS as a C2 channel is, uh, is definitely something that malicious actors will use. Um, it's, it's a lot stealthier than your uh, you know, your HTTP or your uh, HTTPS in that, you know, DNS is a constantly used protocol. There's, you know, tons and tons of traffic happening at any given second, really, on a, on a network. Um, so it's very easy to hide in for malicious actors. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's also something that is not super commonly looked at either from a detection standpoint. So um, it presents a pretty great uh, vector for for malicious actors to use. However, uh, DNS does have some limitations around the protocol and around the size and encryption of messages. So, um, you know, if you're looking for it, it's not that hard to detect, and we'll get into that in a bit. But uh, generally, the way that it's used by malicious actors is either as a backup channel or as a uh, as a you know backdoor or, or something when uh, when other channels don't work. So, uh, and I guess to that point, uh, you know, DNS is also a protocol that's often not blocked. Sometimes, uh, you know, firewall configurations will block literally every protocol except DNS outbound, uh, just so that it, you know, it can be resolved. So that that can be another reason why malicious actors will use it to uh, to escape a network. Um, and just a, a little bit about DNS Cat itself, which is the tool that we've chosen to use here. 
Um, it's an open source command and control framework for DNS. Um, it, it works well, it, it does its job, but it's not the only uh, tool that you can use for this. Uh, there are plenty of other DNS-based C2 uh, programs out there. I think the most common one that, that we see from an incident response perspective is probably Cobalt Strike. They have a, a DNS C2 module in there that's pretty widely used for this sort of thing, but um, DNS Cat does largely the same thing. Uh, there aren't that many options as you'll see in a second with the with DNS as far as how payloads are structured. So uh, I guess without further ado, let's jump right into the demo. So uh, we've got a little bit of a a demonstration of the DNS cat being run here. So here you can see we're just uh, we're starting up DNS cat. Uh, it goes ahead and creates a listener and then off screen we're running a executable on the victim box that will allow us to connect uh, to the DNS cat C2. Uh, so that'll just connect up in a second here. So you can see that the uh, the new window is created, um, and what's important to note is that DNS CAT is establishing an encrypted tunnel as well. So uh, you can see the encryption secrets and and whatnot there um, that DNS CAT is using, and that'll become significant in a bit here. Uh, so you can see now with the Windows command, we do have a a uh, shell, so to speak, on desktop 5Q, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then. Finally, just to uh, kind of demonstrate that we have access, uh, we're going to exfiltrate a credentials file from that host. So uh, you can see that, you know, we exfiltrated that very quickly, um, much more quickly than uh, than we did on Empire. Um, and again, that, that will be significant in a second when we talk about detections. So uh, moving on, what did we see here? So First and foremost, uh, DNS Cat and, and many uh, tools like this have sort of a telltale domain that you can see. So if we take a look at the, the traffic, we'll, we'll just compare with normal DNS traffic first here. So uh, you can see in normal traffic, it's a bunch of different domains. It's uh, you know pretty short, pretty, pretty standard looking URLs. And then we, if we look at actual C2 traffic, you can see there's there's a big difference on the right there as far as you know what's being done. So um, the the big giveaway here obviously is the DNS cat subdomain. Um, that is something that an attacker can configure with DNS cat and and most other tools that do this. However, uh, the subdomain is not probably not going to change much when this type of attack is done, just because. Uh, well, honestly, it's a pain to set up additional ones. So um, a pretty reliable way of detecting this is to just look for that DNS cat string or, you know, whatever it may be in, in your, uh, you know, instance. And the, uh, the other dead giveaway here, and perhaps the more reliable one, is the huge string of encrypted traffic that you see after the DNS cat subdomain. So all of those letters and numbers are, are actually the encrypted C2 traffic that's going back and forth. Um, and that, that's where our credentials file is, is within that string. It's just broken up into all of these 300 length DNS requests. So, um, and I guess the last thing to note too is that all of this happened in a very short time frame. So when it comes to, uh, to looking for DNS, looking for short, short bursts of traffic with extra long uh, DNS lengths, 300 is, is way more than you'd expect for, uh, for normal queries, and a consistent um, unusual subdomain like something like DNS hat is, uh, is what you want to look for. So when it comes to actually implementing a detection, uh, we have a couple of different ways to look at it. The first one, like I said, is, is simply just looking for that DNS cat string. Uh, your mileage may vary as far as when you're looking for uh, for this on a network. Um, however, uh, the much more reliable control is looking for large DNS queries. So most DNS queries are going to be pretty small. Uh, you saw in the the earlier example, you know, querying for fsecure.com is 
probably about 15 characters or something, right? Um, these encrypted blocks were all 300 characters, and that can vary depending on the uh, the program used. But uh, you know, we're just looking for queries of over 100 in size, which should be pretty reliable. Uh, but there's a couple of sort of uh, intricacies that I'd like to point out here, which are that um, you know DNS does not necessarily have an upper limit on traffic, and uh, a quirk about the protocol is that if the traffic is more than 512 bytes in size when it's moving back and forth, it will actually use TCP rather than UDP. So I think a, another rule that you could potentially add here is uh, just alerting on any uh, TCP traffic over port 53 uh, because that that is very non-standard. I, I don't think I can think of a, uh, a domain that's over 512 characters long. Uh, but the, the key point here is, is looking for large DNS queries that are, uh, you know, containing that consistent string. And you can see that, you know, if we run these, uh, we do get the, uh, the possible DNS cat activity uh, alerts firing off here. So, uh, you know, DNS, when it comes to detection uh, and execution, honestly, is, is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. But like I said, it's something that a lot of uh, you know, security programs just don't look for by default. So it's a pretty simple control that you can uh, you can implement, and it might you know save your life in the in the case of a an actual attack where the attacker has established something like a DNS backdoor, and it's going to use that to uh, try to get back in after you've already quarantined them. Uh, so that's that for dns and uh, i'm going to pass it back to derek to cover our, our final and perhaps most interesting lab which is the uh, the dns or not the dns the uh, dropbox api cu thank you jordan so as jordan just said this will be our most complex lab to both set up and then to talk about and um I encourage you to ask any questions uh, later on on the youtube channel if you have any follow-ups um, about how this is all set up so in a traditional attacking framework, what will happen is a box will be attacked by an attacker using um, and controlled by attacker controlled infrastructure. The problem with this, is, for an attacker perspective anyway, is that uh, a defender will be able to simply just uh, use domain categorization and then look at newly observed or registered domains in order to be able to find out which of the domains that, it sees, that a defender sees in their network is actually attacking them which uh, makes it fairly easy to just implement a block list to block any attacker domain. And it makes it fairly easy to spot when an attacker is operating on the network because these domains have um, very obvious tells. However, if you want to avoid this problem entirely, using a trusted service such as Dropbox or Instagram or Twitter or Google Drive or Slack, will give a, the attacker an opportunity to use a trusted service as a way to um, interact with the machines that have been compromised. So this was actually used uh, by the Turla group in uh, Turla, excuse me, Turla malware, uh, which used Instagram comments in actually a Britney Spears picture in mid-2017 to do their C2 activity. So it's not just a hypothetical attack, it's actually an attack that's being uh, used in the wild and to use something like um, Instagram is, uh, is a very clever way to do that. So we're going to talk about using Dropbox to do that next. And so this has actually just been added into C3, uh, I think today, actually. So you can test this out for yourself. And then as you're doing the labs, you can try this out. So it's what it essentially is doing is it's just a um, it's a C3, for those who haven't seen it previously, is a tool that um, makes it easier to emulate threat actors' use of custom channels, such as uh, Dropbox or other uh, esoteric channels. I think UNC was the one that was uh, seen in lab number three. And the idea behind releasing this tool is so that F-Secure can help the uh, defense community to um, analyze real world attacking techniques in a way that um, is easy to set up for, um, for researchers. So to show this in action, I'm gonna show a quick demonstration now. And so, with this, what we're first going to do is we're going to create a channel, and this is going to be our Dropbox channel, and we have to put in our Dropbox API key, and uh, don't get any funny ideas. You can't actually use this API key because uh, the <laughs> it's now been disabled. And so we've created a channel, and we're going to call it a Dropbox channel number one, 
And then in just a moment, we're going to create a relay. Now this relay is what helps connect back the victim machine to the attacking machine. Once we, um, in a moment, we'll show the execution of this, uh, this relay on our Windows 10 uh, victim machine. So uh, hopefully that came through for you all. And so we're gonna take a look at the code base for the C3 Dropbox channel. So as we can see here, um, this is directly from the code for C3. And that a big connection point here is the api.dropbox.com slash two slash file slash search v2. So the reason that the uh, relay is hitting this endpoint is that it allows us to fetch a list of files which are destined for the relay based upon the Dropbox folder they are in. So it's using the Dropbox folder itself to transmit everything. So we can see the query being constructed in this code. So just to confirm this functionality, we'll take a look at the Dropbox API. And as we can see here, these are the things used by C3 in order to be able to create the C2 channel. So it's using things like reading files, it's searching the files and it's deleting files all using, the, um, using C3. So before Relay can actually communicate with Dropbox, it must first resolve the domain name api.dropboxapi.com that it intends to use for polling the configured folder. Likewise, as we can see from the above table, a second URL needs resolving to write messages to Dropbox, so content.dropboxapi.com. So if we use syspawn configured to log DNS queries, we can see the relay executable producing EID 22s for each query. So um, keep in mind that this will happen once per request. So it's not going to happen every time. You won't see these event 22s over and over again. So this gives us a detection opportunity here because we would expect to see a very small number of processes that legitimately uh, make DNS queries for these URLs. So as an example, um, Dropbox client would make uh, queries or browsers would make queries. And so if we're operating in a very uh, restricted corporate environment that has no legitimate use for Dropbox, um, any process requesting Dropbox APIs would be considered uh, worthy of investigation. However, keep in mind that certain applications that are not a browser and are not Dropbox uh, might actually make legitimate requests, such as things that use the Dropbox SDK in order to operate, so applications or perhaps phone applications that use that. So in order to show um, some of the beaconing traffic, so what we've done here is we've set up a Microsoft Windows Web IO ETW provider, and these instructions will be included in the laboratory if you'd like to follow along for this section if this is uh, a little bit too fast for right now. And so what we're going to do is uh, talk about sort of the beaconing traffic. So um, and to, based on your infrastructure, you might need to configure um, intercepting this. This might this probably won't be enabled by default. So having reviewed the C3 channel code, we know that our relay will repeatedly check the contents of the Dropbox folder for files to read. So this is much like the UNC file share we saw in our last lab using C3. So um, if we look for this, we can see our, so let's say we want to um, create a uh, sort of a custom uh, jitter for this. So we can use uh, C3 to set an upload delay jitter. And so we've done, so what we've done here is we've set it to be exactly every 10 seconds. So that would mean that we have a detection opportunity here if something is this regular, because we can check for it happening every 10 seconds, which would be a good indicator that there's something going on and that the Dropbox channel is being pulled every 10 seconds. So however, it's possible to change this to make it much more difficult to detect. For example, um, you can change it to happen only once a day or every three hours or sometimes every three hours and sometimes every nine hours. So this can be difficult to detect. However, if it's left sort of by default or if they've created a regular polling time, then this might be easier to detect on your network using some of these more advanced tools. So we're gonna talk about the um, sort of the handshake that happens here when a, an action is uh, executed using a relay. So uh, for this lab, we've just used a ping command to induce a write action. Uh, you can use something more complex like a covenant grunt as an example, but um, just for this, we've used a ping command. So observing the web requests created from our relay executable, we can see the calls to download, delete, and upload. From a functional perspective, what we're seeing here is ahead of the below requests, our attacker C3 server, also known as a gateway, has written a message to our relay. Our relay will then make an API request to download this this file using the uh, Dropbox API. Then once it's downloaded and read, it will delete the files themselves and then upload a response to the message using the files upload. And so we can actually sort of see this little um, read, delete, and write APIs, and you can see them all sort of in close proximity together, uh, highlighted in red for this request. And from here, we're actually going to move on, uh, and that would, that would actually be the, uh, the rest of our sort of CT presentation that concludes that section. 
And we're actually going to move on now and talk about what we talked about over all three of these labs. And I'm going to hand it off to Jordan for that. Thanks, Derek. So yeah, today we uh, we looked at a couple of different ways for C2 channels and, and exfiltration to be set up. Uh, you know, we we looked at DNS, we looked at HTTP, and you know, we also looked at Dropbox, which uh, you know is a, a pretty wide panoply of C2 channels. But uh, especially as you saw in the uh, the Dropbox bit, there are plenty more that actors can use. So uh, it's less in in terms about uh, detection, it's less about writing rules and, and having uh, you know a very specific setup, and more about understanding the way that C2 channels operate and how you can use that to to detect them. So you know you saw that sort of thought process throughout the uh, throughout the labs here, but when it comes to these other channels, it's something that you know you can adapt to on your own. You can rely on the threat intelligence community. Um, and you know you your mileage may vary, but uh, as long as you understand the way that you know the actors are thinking and the way that they're setting these things up, um, it's it's really not too much of a challenge to detect most C2 channels. So you know you want to have as much data as you can. Uh, we sh we showed only a small piece of of what you can use to detect these. You know we we just showed the the network captures and the uh, the ETW data, but uh, you know you can use things like Windows event logs or um, any kind of process data or memory captures to uh, to do the same sort of things forensically. Um, it's just a, a question of looking at different artifacts. But the key here is, you know, it's always going to be a, a bulk of sort of odd outgoing traffic to an external server, probably one that you don't recognize. Uh, and with encrypted data being passed through it. So, uh, you know, using that as a, a fundamental baseline for your detections will will help you identify any of these things in the future. So, yeah. uh, sorry, Jordan, I just, I just wanted to, to add to that, like there's a, a few things there that we can say, like even even in the first of the, the workshops, um, we had Ricardo looking at some some um, memory captures. Um, I think it was of, a, of the the Excel process, and we could see, for instance, the domain name. In that case, it was just the IP address um, that was buried in in the the memory space for that. And that's probably a great example of what you just said there. Around you can use different artifacts to kind of build that picture. And if you know that that IP or or in a, a more realistic case, that domain name is malicious, um, that can feed into your um, your kind of block listing and um, your domain categorization, and uh, ultimately prevent those channels from going out on other affected devices as well. Yeah, no, that that's a great example of exactly what I'm talking about is is, you know, sort of adapting to to the situation and using uh, using the data and experience you have to to build those mm -hmm. detections. So hopefully what we've shown you here today uh, will help you build a baseline for that. But there's plenty more out there as far as research and as far as you know other labs and things that you can explore to uh, to help you continue to build that knowledge base. And on that note, um, if you're interested in learning some more about attacker techniques and tooling, uh, we've got a, a pretty awesome workshop coming up uh, and that's going to go up next month. Uh, it's called Meet the Reds and it's a uh, it's a workshop where we'll actually show you a bunch of the tooling that that we're building. You know, you saw a little bit of C3 today, but it has a ton of more capabilities that are really quite interesting and, and will show you a lot more as far as C2s go and in that whole uh, realm of things. We've also got a uh, physical memory attack toolkit and a, a Jamf toolkit as well, uh, which you know some of you might even use on your networks. Uh, so there's some really cool tools there. You'll have a chance to ask any questions of uh, of the developers and you know get a sort of uh, inside look at how these tools are developed and how they can be used uh, for uh, for exploitation. So that should be really interesting. Uh, definitely try to make it if you can. Um, and I just want to say and, and repeat again as well, if uh, if you have any questions on on what we talked about today, feel free to visit the YouTube version of the recording. Uh, like Alfie said, unfortunately, we don't have 
the uh, the question functionality working today, but you should be able to go to the YouTube video and just drop us a comment there and we'll be happy to to respond and, and discuss with you about uh, C2 channels or, or whatever it is that you have a question about. So on that, that note, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, Alfie, did you have something to, to add? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say on, on the, the C3 front, obviously with, with Dropbox out today, um, there is a, a C3 channel in the, the Bloodhound Slack group if you're if you're um, in there. Um, so feel free to fire any questions at us in there. Um, the, the, the developers are in there as well, so you can get some quick feedback on any uh, issues or, or wider questions you might have. Yeah, we uh, we have quite a few ways for you to to contact us. So, you know, reach out any way that you can and and uh, you know, we're always happy to talk about security if you if you can tell. So uh, so yeah, thank you all for for attending. Thanks for for checking out these labs and you know, hopefully there was something uh, something in there that you can use in your own environment and, and you can use to build your own defensive strategy. Great. Thanks guys. See you next time.